The Six Nations Show on OTB Sports Radio. With Vodafone, official sponsors of the Irish rugby team. Team of us. Everyone in. It's spinning. It's spinning. Updates, analysis and opinion across all OTB channels from start to finish. Got it. I've never seen a team like Ireland before. This is OTB Sports Radio. OTB Sports Radio. Uh, good afternoon and you're very welcome along to episode 5 of the Six Nations show here on OTB Sports. We're streaming across otbsports.com, the OTB Sports app, on our YouTube and social channels. All of this brought to you with thanks to Vodafone, team of us, everyone in. Get as many comments as you want into us now on YouTube or on our Twitter at Off The Ball. What are your prevailing thoughts from the Six Nations? It's all over now. How does the report card read? Are there any aid grades for Ireland? Is it all must do better in general? Who were Ireland's standout performances in the competition? Who's your choice for player of the tournament? Because we're going to be discussing all of that, as usual, with Kean Tracy, who is joining me on Skype. Kean, afternoon. It's been a while since episode four of the Six Nations show. Yeah, I was just thinking there, joined as usual. It doesn't really feel very usual. I'm not even in the studio there with you, but yeah, no, good, good to be back. Anyway, it's been it's been a while, like you said. So last time, last time we spoke on the Six Nations show, at least was uh, it was the Thursday just after the England, or it was the Thursday, the week of when Ireland were, should have been playing Italy uh, in the middle of March. It was actually about twenty minutes after Leo Varadkar had made his big announcement, saying that pretty much Ireland was beginning to shut down for for two weeks. That was back in the middle of March. You arrived in probably about five minutes after Leo Varadkar made that statement and we're looking at each other thinking, we're, are, we, are we doing this Six Nations? I, I think we are doing, still doing this show. I mean, there's no match this weekend, but look, we got on with us. That was episode four. We said at the time, uh, I remember at the end of that episode, you know, hopefully we'll be back sometime soon to, to do episode five and talk about, the, uh, talk about the Italy and France games. It took us a long time, but we finally got here. Yeah, and I think, like, even thinking back to that day, I think I was one of the last people allowed in the doors of this <laughs> yeah. kind of shut down. And just as I arrived in, the whole place was getting um, the talk about how it was going into lockdown. So I felt very much like a, a, a fish out of water in there. But, yeah, I suppose, like, it's a bit obvious to say a, a lot has changed. But um, it's I was watching back, you know, bits of the highlights from from the earlier games and just to see, you know, full houses and just how different it is now. And I know we'll probably get onto it, but like Super Saturday didn't quite live up to it. And I wonder how much of that was down to the fact that they were, they were played behind closed doors. So yeah, it was a, it was a disappointing finish, um, particularly because there had been plenty of, you know, signs of encouragement, but in the two big games, I guess Ireland ultimately came up short. Yeah, and quite a bit short in the end in those couple of games. So coming up, we'll be doing our awards for the tournament. That'll be towards the end of this episode. We'll be picking out our player of the tournament, best Irish player as well, because I think it's fair to say neither of us have picked an Irish player as our player of the tournament. Our unsung hero across the competition, biggest disappointment over the course of the, of the five rounds, best try and best game as well. So if you want to join in on that, get your comments into us on our YouTube stream or on Twitter, at Off The Ball as well for us though. First though, I suppose it's just the Ireland Six Nations recap. So wins against Scotland, Wales and Italy, defeats to England and France, so three home wins, two away defeats. A campaign probably keen, we're glad to see the back of. Yeah, I, mean, like at least, I suppose at least we did get to, to get to finish it. That's probably the, the, the one big positive. But um, yeah, like it, it, it's so difficult and almost a little bit unfair to, to judge it as a whole because you think about how disrupted everything was. But... There, like I said, there were signs of encouragement, but kind of when it came down to it against the, the, the two big teams, Ireland were were well short, really, on both days. And while I know we'll get into it, they, they did play quite well in the first half at the weekend. Just the way they went to pieces in the second half was uh, was pretty concerning. If you think back to, like, even the, the opening game against Scotland, that Stuart Hogg, you know, knock on over the line, you know, how different would the game have been if, if that hadn't happened? Ireland really weren't great. That day, okay, they improved significantly and beat Wales. But if you just look at how Wales have performed throughout the Six Nations, and okay, they're going through a bit of a transition as well under Wayne Pivac. But maybe that result against Wales said more about Wales than than it did against Ireland. And then you had the Twickenham absolute nightmare um, 
what unfolded there. And, you know, it, it, the, the lockdown came at a bad time because Italy would have been an ideal time to, to get back on the horse. There was a long time left stewing over that, I suppose. In the, in, in the meantime, you had Leinster losing to, to Saracens in a pretty similar way, to be honest, which which did leave concerns, I guess, heading into that France game. And, OK, the, the Italy game, it, the Italy game is always going to be, you know, tough to judge properly because you're damned if you do, damned if you don't. Mm. And there were plenty, like, there, there was a lot to like about Hard and went about their business against Italy. You know, they threw more offloads than they had done in the six, in any Six Nations games last year. But, like, Italy, let's face it, are really, really poor. Um, they put it up to England a bit at the weekend, but again, fell short. So the two biggest tests, I don't think we saw, like, we, we, it was just so disappointing to see the capitulation in the second half last week after having done plenty of good things. So as a whole, it's a very, very mixed and a, a tough first campaign for Andy Farrell, you know, and, and the new coaching staff. Like they've had such a disrupted time with the players, but it's sort of hard to know where you stand after it all really, isn't it? Yeah, like it's a really tricky one. Now, obviously with those two, with the, the three Autumn Nations Cup games still to come, like, I mean, technically it's still... There are still three games left in Andy Farrell's first season as Ireland head coach. But like already to this point, it feels like it hasn't been one season. It's been two little mini seasons almost because, you know, he gets, what, three games in the, the opening round of the Six Nations. Summer tests get canned and then all of a sudden you're coming back in for, for two games crammed in either side of a busy club, uh, busy club campaign and then Autumn Nations Cup afterwards. And like even in terms of personnel, looking at the... The players he was dealing with for the opening few games, like I think in particular the bench probably for the Italy and France games, it just looked like it lacked that little bit of depth, like missing someone like Dave Kilcoyne coming off the bench. And, you know, no disrespect to like Finley Bealham, but it is a much different proposition when you've Tyg Furlong starting and Andrew Porter coming off a bench. Or even, like was a, if I remember correctly, at the start of the Six Nations, where you're, if, uh, for Leinster at times in the Champions Cup last season, Andrew Porter starting and Tyg Furlong coming off the bench. And we were also excited to be seeing maybe someone like uh, Ryan Baird getting run out over the, the few weeks and all of a sudden he picked up an injury. We now might get, might get to see him again in a few weeks. Jordan Larmer misses out and all of a sudden... Uh, like Jacob Stockdale has to stay in that starting 15 when I think a lot of people might have thought that it might have been best to take him out of the firing line for a little while and then you look back at the when the game against Italy was cancelled and all the players that we were expecting to come in when we thought that Andy Farrell this was going to be the game where he was going to give all these players a chance maybe the likes of John Cooney who'd been in such unbelievable form it might have been the time that Ross Byrne actually got a proper Six Nations start and some significant minutes in a in a 10 jersey as well. There were other players who were in great form. Jack O'Donoghue springs to mind. He was unbelievable for Munster towards the end of the, the Heineken Champions Cup pool stages. And all of a sudden, those players lose out. And you look at someone like John Cooney then, who didn't really start the... the didn't get back up to speed properly in the restart. He was struggling for his form a little. And he went from a position where he was probably going to be starting a Six Nations game against Italy to not even in the squad. And just the, the breakup of those two campaigns with the lockdown, like it did throw a lot out of balance. Yeah, and it's funny how the, the kind of mood music changes because when going into the World Cup last year, we were all, including myself, talking about Ireland's strength and depth. And, you know, a few months later, we're kind of looking at it and it's it's pretty callow. Like, I think you're right. Like, it's to miss the calibre of players. Like, any team would miss, you know, the likes of a Ty Furlong, Ian Henderson, Jordan Armour, these guys... Um, Gary Ringrose especially but you're right the, the bench that came off um, at the weekend like it's it just it, away away to France in, in, in Paris it's not it, it's not what you need and it's um, unfortunately where Ireland find themselves in and it's no disrespect to to those guys and like Andy Farrell's hand was uh, was forced you know um, but if you look at the front row in, in, in particular you, you look at what France are bringing off the bench and the likes of Camille Shat and like they're game changers, and I just don't think Ireland had enough of them on the bench. Now, to give Andy Farrell his dues, I think um, he has brought in new guys. You look at Caelan Doris has been brought in. You look at Will Connors. You look at Hugo Keenan. He has gone to Jacob Stockdale at fullback. I know we might touch on that 
a bit later, but he has made big decisions. You know, you, you think back to Caelan Doris starting ahead of Peter O'Mahony and O'Mahony then Doris getting injured on his debut and O'Mahony coming back in and playing really well. So we've we've spoken so much and particularly last year um, about, you know, wanting to see an Ireland head coach pick players on form. And I think by and large, I know some people will, will always have their gripes, particularly maybe about the halfbacks, but by and large, I think Andy Farrell has picked on form. You know, this is what we want to see, but maybe just the form isn't quite quite good enough. And, you know, I was writing about this in um, in yesterday's paper. Look, for me, there are still really worrying scars left from what happened last year. And as much as, you know, you do want to look forward, I think it's quite concerning when you look at the signs. Like, you think back to to the England game all the way back last year at home and we know like how bad that went and Joe Schmidt describing the team as being a little bit broken. Um, you saw the, the effects that had throughout the year right up to the World Cup and then when at the World Cup quarterfinal when the All Blacks beat Ireland, Joe Schmidt said again that he was feeling a bit broken and that the scars, like he was going to be scarred by it for, for some time. But I think as time has gone on, it's become clear that those scars aren't just with Joe Schmidt. I think they're with this the squad as a whole and you know, a few we've been chatting to a few of the players um, over the last few days. Again, I was just chatting to CJ Standard there on a on a call this morning, and you know they're quite positive in that it was their own kind of small errors as they described them against France at the weekend. But the issue is there's too many small errors, and they add up, and that's kind of the the problem for Ireland at the moment. I think a really worrying aspect of it all for me is. Um, is the mental side of it. Last week, James Ryan and Robbie Henshaw like, were both up for media and they were talking about, you know, the importance of players not going into their shells. Like when you go to Paris and Paris behind closed doors is not, you know, is not the same as going there with 80,000 people. Um, and then when you hear Andy Farrell after the game saying that he, he thought there was a lack of belief within the team and that players did go into their shells, like, I find that astonishing, really, that there's a lack of belief within a squad that has a Six Nations title on the line. And fair enough, it was always going to be a tough ask. But can you imagine the boost they would have got on Saturday when England huffed and puffed against Italy and really didn't put up the kind of score that I and probably many uh, people were expecting? So that that Ireland went into the, the France game not needing necessarily the bonus point win but just needing six points and to score a try or else a seven-point win must have been a huge boost. And that they were only trailing was at 17-13 at half time. And you're talking about a lack of belief within the players. And Andrew Conway spoke about it on, after the game as well, saying that like it's a pretty it's a bad sign, you know, it's a bad place to be in when when that's the situation. You, your coaches are recognizing poor body language. And for me, that's that's very concerning because this is supposed to be a new era. It's supposed to be, you know, fresh. Everything's supposed to be new. We're supposed to have left last year behind. And while I do think that Ireland played well, like I just, I, I'm, I'm amazed by this talk of um, a lack of belief. You know. Yeah, and like it's interesting. Like what you were saying there was uh, how interesting it was when the task, the task changed pretty much like in the hour before the game in Paris because all week. Like I remember on the show here, much of the, pretty much all the discourse was you're you're probably talking Ireland have to win a bonus point with a bonus point because you were assuming England were going to put up a big score. You thought that you know it was going to be Ireland were going to have to overturn the guts of maybe twenty five to thirty points on the differential and beat France. And if you're going to be doing that, I mean it's kind of a given you'd have to be getting a bonus point to do it anyway. And then all of a sudden they're into a situation where it's just six points and. Like we were talking about it last week as well, and we were saying that because of the size of the challenge, it, it kind of felt like the only way Ireland were going to win that game and actually do it was if it was a complete slugfest, you know, punch after punch, two gunslingers going at it, like a 40-35 game. And it's kind of impossible to see Ireland playing France and beating them 40-35 because, you know, Ireland just, it's not their natural game and it's the exact game script that France want. And all of a sudden, to be coming in needing just six points in that hour, I started to feel anyway that, do you know what? Now that the task is smaller, now that Ireland know they just have to win by six or seven, uh, potentially, that all of a sudden it felt more realistic. And like the mental side of the game, as you were saying as well, is really interesting. It was something Alan Quinlan was talking about on OTBM yesterday, where he was saying that 
And he referenced Robbie Henshaw as well, as you did, talking about, you know, you, you can't be afraid going into those games. And, like, in fairness, for pretty much all the first half, they conceded the first try. And you're thinking, oh, God, it's going to be a long night. And it looked like straight away they'd put it behind them. And they came out and they were playing their game and they actually played brilliantly in that first half. And I'd love to know what the... I'd love to know what was being said at halftime or what the body language was like in the changing rooms at the Stade de France on Saturday night because having played pretty much all the rugby for, I'd say, three quarters or 80% of that first half, they give up that second try uh, after Jacob Stockdale's miss. All of a sudden, they're a good few points down again. They get it back to within four and you know, they turn down the shot at goal to cut, close the gap to just one point before half time. They go towards the corner they make a mess of the line out, all of a sudden it's a four point game. Like they're walking back into the changing rooms, having dominated the entire first half, they're four points down. And it just felt for me like from that point on, when they came out in the second half, that they just looked like a beaten docket, that like their confidence was absolutely shot. That I don't know, maybe were they thinking to themselves, we've done all the rugby, we've done all the game, we've played all the rugby, and we're still four points down. Like, what, like are they kind of thinking, what more do we have to do? And, Again, it's down to those simple errors. And as you said, like simple errors are okay when they are like f you know, very rare. But the problem is that there are a lot of simple errors throughout the game. And it just looked like that once that second half started, Ireland started to go off script. They started to chase the game a lot more. And after that, you're just playing straight into France's hands. Yeah, look, again, like why, why are professional players who are, let's face it, like the the top top players in this country why are they going into their shells like i mean there's a six nations up for grabs here and you think back to it is only two years ago when ireland were beating everyone that came before them there are a few new faces in the team but it hasn't changed all that much so that's why i'm very concerned that you know like you mentioned you'd love to know what the what it was like at half time like we have to take it that it was pretty bad at half time because andy farrell has already come out and said that the belief wasn't there where it should be, and that the talk at half time was to have more belief. Now, like that, it's crazy. Like it's really, really that 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 to me, like Ireland didn't get bullied and dominated by France, which was a fear going into the game, as they had done, we'll say against England or or the All Blacks. So th that was a positive in itself. But not having the mental fortitude to go and like to just to collapse like that. And like you said, the the, the decision before half time was was absolutely crucial and I don't even think this is one of those ones where you look back and with the benefit of hindsight because at the time it just felt like you know take the take the three points that were on offer now for me it summed up the muddled approach of of the game plan and what Ireland were doing and maybe this feeds into you know the the, the mental state of the squad as a whole, because if you think, you know, Conor Murray took a kick from, what was it, 55, 57 metres at the start of the game, and you're kind of thinking, yeah, like that's, you know, he had the distance, it's, it's a good strategy, you know, get the points on the board. The, the bonus point is not irrelevant here, but it's not a requirement to, to win the championship like we thought it might be. So having set out their stall to take the points, it just didn't make sense to me to, to be going for the corner. And like Johnny Sexton was asked about it afterwards and he said like it was a brave decision. I, I just, I, I don't really get that. And you could see him having uh, the conversation with James Ryan um, and it wasn't really much of a conversation. Well, that's what it looked like on, on TV. James Ryan has obviously, you know, become the pack leader. He's the line out caller now, which like didn't really go too well for him at the weekend but it was a pretty short snappy conversation and I wonder did you need did you need someone a bit more leadership um, in that position because I, I don't know who's going to stand up to Johnny Sexton in that team because he had clearly made up his mind that he wanted to go to the corner but I would have liked to have seen you know I don't know like James Ryan and CJ Standard there are guys who are used to or needing their you know I would have liked to have seen someone maybe step up and go let's have a think about what we're doing here because like you said, the lift that it gave France going into the break, and also on the flip side, it really dented Ireland because they they come out in the second half and was it four minutes um, after half time they concede the try and 
and that's the game. And you know, to use the old cliche, championship minutes either side of the break. Ireland, Ireland lost them, and it proved absolutely detrimental. Mm -hmm. I, on the issue of Sexton, he was someone that uh, people have been speaking a lot about over the last couple of days. There was, you know, the incident where he came off the pitch and looked very, very unhappy. He was making his uh, making his facial expressions known to the cameras and. A lot of players have had their say over the last couple of days, including yesterday Keith Wood and Brian O'Driscoll. I, I thought he... I've read a good bit of stuff online and, and I think lots of people, have, certainly from my perspective, didn't get the 50, 65 minutes that he played. I thought he played quite well. And you've got to remember, Johnny Sexton is comfortably our, still our, our number 10 and that in itself, there lies an issue. Um, if we're still relying on a 35-year-old out half, as great as Johnny Sexton has been, and I know that there's been issues with, um, you know, with Joey Carberry, obviously, um, you know, Paddy Jackson a few years ago, maybe he would have made the progression too, but but hasn't for um, for obvious reasons. Um, it, we are in a real predicament from the number 10 position uh, because Johnny Sexton is coming to the winter of his career, and he's not. Uh, the vintage years of a couple of years uh, uh, seasons ago, but he is still very much the man in possession. Um, and I think he offers the most with, without a shadow of a doubt. I think, unfortunately for Ross Byrne, he came on and for his 15 minutes, um, he must have made you know three or four poor errors. Um, he didn't. It didn't feel as though there was any fluidity to running the back line. It was all quite static and shipping the pass on, making it easy for the French defence. Um, so I actually thought that Johnny Sexton played a reasonably good game. Um, you know, considering um, the lofty expectations we have from him, I thought he was still quite good. That said, um, I don't think it's a, it, visually it's a good thing to have your captain coming off and shaking his head the way he did. And I'm sure he's regretful of that. And, I'm, and I hope he, he kind of had a quiet word to his coach and apologise as, as Johnny Sexton um, has struggled to do in the past. I know he's grown as a player, but I think that visually for the rest of the team looking up, and indeed R R Ross Byrne looking up at the big screen, and it was this prolonged visual of him looking up to the coach's box and shaking his head. As captain, you can't do that. I think you have to be able to park your own disappointment and, and move on and let the next guy coming in to shake things up. That said, I thought it was a poor tactical decision because, uh, because of what you know, his replacement uh, subsequently offered. Because, Keith, w what Johnny Sexton was experiencing was a perfectly natural reaction, of course. He's shaking his head, but he knows there's a camera on him. And then he glances up at the big screen and knows that he's on the big screen and doubles down with his reaction. Yeah, he can, look, you might get away with it as a, as a player, you can't as a captain. And he has to lead with his body language, he has to lead with his performance, he has to lead with the respect that he has for his coach. And anyway, for me, I, I actually wouldn't have taken him off. I would have said that he was the he was the player that may have been able to pull something magical out in the next 10 or 15 minutes um, uh, and I would have left him on. I understand the frustration, but it was a dreadful look. Um, uh, just touching on Brian's point, he is the best 10 we have. Um, we've seen... Um, uh, we've seen other players trying to come in and try and do, do something as well. Ross Byrne coming in at the weekend didn't show enough. I thought he showed about six or seven weeks ago in, in one of the matches where he came in, he started taking the ball to the line. I said, wow, if he does that, he has a chance to push on. Um, and now this was a big game and he didn't push on. So are we going to go and look at other options apart from that? Because if he's not going to be the man to, to try and lead us over the line, and if Johnny is 35 and will not be the future, I mean, I know he wants to play till he's 40, but we want to have, we really want the Johnny Sexton of... Yeah. two or three years ago, you know, so... So that was Brian O'Driscoll and Keith Wood speaking on last night's Monday Night Rugby. You can podcast it back in full on the OTB Podcast Network as well if you haven't heard all of it. So, Keen, like, to go back on, it was actually probably, I think, the first point Brian O'Driscoll made, which I think is the most important one, is that uh, he says Johnny Sexton, at this stage of his career, is still comfortably the best out-half available to Ireland. And he kind of went off and said, you know, therein kind of lies the problem as well, is that, you know, Johnny Sexton, we're trying to think of what comes next after him because as much as he wants to play till he's 40, that's still only just a few years away. It's only a few years down the line. And if you look at Ross Burns' minutes throughout the tournament, 
He comes on in the 69th minute against France. He comes on in the 70th minute against Italy. 66th minute against uh, England. 71st minute against Wales. When that game, you know, that was a game that Ireland were comfortable in. And in the 73rd minute against Scotland, like over the having played all five games, that is not a lot of minutes tagged up across five matches for Ross Byrne. And you're going to have to wonder eventually, like at what stage is he going to be trusted to do it? in a bigger game if Ireland do actually need him and it, when is he going to have the confidence to be able to go out there and do it because like they say he went down on Saturday and you know made a few mistakes and stuff like that but if you're if you're getting as little time as he is I don't think you necessarily feel the confidence that you know there's trust in you to go out and actually turn a game around yeah it's true in, in fairness he's been put into some tricky situations you think back to his uh, debut in Twickenham in the World Cup warm-up game last year which was you know a horror show and he kind of got bombed out of the squad then um look i know leinster have a, had a lot of faith in ross Byrne. i mean he ended up starting was at the pro 14 um final um ahead of johnny sexton as well um but yeah like it's tough that, that I, I agree with what brian and keith were saying there i didn't really get the logic in taking sexton off he clearly wasn't injured judging by his reaction and you know the reaction like it's just not a good look for for your captain and you wonder what that does for for Ross Byrne either now I don't know did he did he see it or whatever but it was obviously flashed up on um the big screen because because Johnny Sexton looked up with it and something similar happened last year um I think it was in Rome when Jack Harty came on and Sexton kicks the water bottles and you know these are two young guys who you know the country is hoping to will push on and you know, take over Sexton's mantle. Eventually, I think the Joey Carberry situation is, it's just awful. Like, it's its awful for Munster, it's awful for Irish rugby, but it's, most importantly, it's awful for, for him himself. And, you know, there's absolutely no time frame on his return. He's hes ruled out indefinitely. So, unfortunately, Andy Farrell is going to have to press ahead and, and plan without him. And, and you, you're right, and the, the two lads are right, you know, there is a, still a considerable gap between Johnny Sexton and the likes of Ross Byrne, Jack Harty, you say, you know, when is he going to get trusted? Like, it's got to be in the Nations Cup over the next few weeks. There is absolutely no value whatsoever in playing Johnny Sexton in every one of these games. OK, I think the Twickenham game might be a game where you see, you know, Ireland's full team going there because it's something, it kind of goes back to the earlier point I was making about the, you know, the mental side of things. I think it's become a bit of a hoodoo now against England and Mario Atoje, um, that they're, they're just going to have to go and get over. So I think that game might stand alone a bit differently. But, you know, Wales are coming to Dublin on Friday week. And for me, I just don't see the value in, in starting Johnny Sexton in, in that game. We all know what he can do. We, like if, if we're talking about, you know, going into next year's Six Nations and obviously the World Cup in 2023, is, is Sexton still going to be the main man, and it, it, it throws up a, a lot of problems. Um, it throws up problems about the out half itself, and it throws up, you know, problems about, about, about the captaincy. And it's a big decision that Andy Farrell is, is going to have to make because if if Andy Farrell is taking Johnny Sexton off with the game still in the balance in Paris, it, it suggests that, you know, he's not going to be an 80 minute man come France in 2023. Now, I was one of the people who thought that James Ryan might have you know been given the captaincy after the world cup for this six nations that was just my own sort of personal opinion i think johnny sexton had earned his shot i really do i think he has and he's done like by and large quite quite a good job he, he seems to deal with the refs quite good which would have been a bit of a concern going into it he's done it well for leinster he's clearly a massively respected leader but if he's not going to be on the pitch for for 80 minutes like is it time maybe to look at someone else who's going to be on the pitch for 80 minutes and also going to be a guaranteed starter at the next World Cup and it's it's a big decision I think that, that Andy Farrell faces but with the Autumn Nations Cup coming up like it's it's a good opportunity because like it's one obviously we didn't think we, we'd get and while like you know I don't think there's any prize money at stake the world ranking um, has already been decided for the World Cup which is absolutely huge that gives you a little bit more leeway you know to try a few things and mm. Between now and that World Cup, and I'm not trying to get hung up on the World Cup, I know I keep mentioning it, but like Ireland are not going to get a better chance to, to blood new guys because you think about you know the, the tours, like you're talking about a summer tour next year, there's absolutely no guarantee 
that that will go ahead. You know, it, it would be a great development option because the Lions would be on at the same time, but who knows what position the world is going to be in then. So I really think you have to take advantage of these games. And there are like a, a good few guys knocking on the door uh, ready to come in, maybe not necessarily in out half, but if we want to see what the likes of Jack Carty and Ross Byrne, and for me, like I, I hope we get to see Harry Byrne um, in the Autumn Nations Cup as well. I know he's kind of like, you know, the next big hope, but he does have something a little bit different. And he playing again for, for Leinster last night and he had a lovely little um, break and offload to create a try, I think it was for uh, Tommy O'Brien. So like we've seen flashes in him while I'm not, you know, saying that the Pro 14 on a Monday night is the same as, you know, stepping up in, in the Six Nations game in Paris. These are the guys who we're going to be hoping to see in a few years' time. And I think there's a real hunger and desire from supporters now as well to kind of see, you know, a little bit of uh, fresh ideas, fresh faces. We know what a lot of the tried and trusted can do. And it's a big opportunity, I think, to, you mentioned like Ryan Baird earlier, um, James Lowe, you, you'd imagine will get a debut, Shane Daly. Like I'd like to see Craig Casey, you know, even if it's off the bench in uh, in one of the, the, the back end of the games, like George. Something. You'd just really like to see how, how these guys get on. They're playing really well for their provinces um, and we won't get a better chance to see what they're like. Um, we are going to have to move on from this topic. I do just want to throw in one last question I thought of there. Uh, while we we're talking about Nations Cup, for example, James Lowe aside, because I think we all assume it's a given that he's going to be playing at some point, probably against Wales in a couple of weeks' time. But if Keane Tracy right now is sitting there, three debuts that you want to see over the next few weeks, who are you going for? James Lowe aside, because let's assume he is going to be playing. Um, I'd probably go for three lads who who I mentioned there. Um, Craig Casey, um, I'd love to see because we, we can we know what Conor Murray will do. Now, he's got a, a good bit of traffic ahead of him. Obviously, Gibson Park is coming here. Marmion is there as well, and John Cooney. But I think he adds something a little bit different. Because out half is such an issue, I would like to see how Harry Byrne would get on. Um, even if it's off the bench for 20 minutes, half an hour, like personally, I would like to see him start. Why not? And I think Ryan Baird as well. I think all things being equal, Ryan Baird will be starting in the second row with James Ryan, I think, at the World Cup. Um, we've seen glimpses of his dynamism, his power. Like He's still growing. He's still growing into his frame. He looks like you know really ready for, for test rugby. So... They're just three of the guys um, I'd like to see, but there are, there are plenty knocking on the door, and I think now is the time to see them. Plenty of texts coming in here now as well. Um, this one from Rob in Dublin. Do we need to see a change of five or six players now heading into next year? A fit Levy, John Cooney, Chris Farrell, Baird, to mention a few. Uh, we're just touching on that. Like I think Ryan Baird, for example, will certainly be getting a debut over the next few weeks if he's fit. Dan Levy, on the other hand... Probably, I think you're talking about Six Nations next year for Levy if he's getting back in. Still just getting those minutes with Leinster and fantastic to see him playing again last night. Are we physically and aggressively well behind France and England now that this could be and uh, now that this could be a two-year fix? That's from Ollie in Greystones. Uh, and some good ones here on the, the issue of Johnny Sexton. Uh, some contrasting opinions as well. This one from Colm in Dublin. Sexton has to lose the captaincy after his childish behaviour on Saturday. We wouldn't see the likes of Brian O'Driscoll or Paul O'Connell at that. They were true captains. Sexton's a leader, but not a captain. Uh, then the next sex, uh, Sexton is still one of the best players in the world, and I feel his reaction was right. He's playing in an Irish team that just aren't on the level he expects. That's from Sarah in Terenure. Another text in here, uh, we need a fully fit Carberry or Ross Byrne to start showing attitude and maybe be like what Johnny was to Raj and show that there's a bit of hate with this guy in my place. Sexton feels he owns the jersey because no one will stand up to him. And that's from Alan in Castle Troy uh, in Limerick. That's probably a good point as well. Maybe that someone needs to, to actually step up and, and challenge Sexton and be, I suppose, be the bad guy a little bit, as much of a cliche as that is. Uh, guys, how good is that French half-back pairing? So exciting to watch. Best in the world, says Christopher. Uh, Aaron says, I thought Hugo Keenan played very well in his two games and hope to see more of him. Not the biggest guy, but the biggest heart and leaves it all out on the pitch. And then Liam in Limerick, should we look at these upcoming fixtures as a chance to bring Casey in uh, for... Uh, uh, K Casey bring... To bring in Casey, sorry, from the off... And then James Lowe is who we all want to see stick on a green jersey, lads. The lad is total rugby, says Rory in Knock Lion. So before we move on to our uh, awards from the tournament, quickly, uh, Keen, 
like obviously it was a huge disappointment for the Irish women's team losing that last game of the Six Nations against France after France had done such a really generous thing and offered to come over here and play it while the under 20s as well they didn't get a chance to resume their campaign at all having had such a great start as well like contrasting emotions I suppose from the Irish women's team point of view they had three home games they got their three wins which is what they were targeting at the start of the tournament but unfortunately now they've, they've lost out in that game and they've got a World Cup qualifying tournament coming up soon and every minute of rugby for them is going to be absolutely huge. Yeah, and the, the issue is they don't know when that tournament is going to be. So you think about that in any sort of sporting context, you know, you're trying to, you know, you're trying to hit your peak at a certain time and it must be so tough for Adam Griggs and his coaching staff and the players, you know, because they just don't know when, when that's going to be. And obviously it's absolutely vital that Ireland are at um, the next World Cup in New Zealand. But yeah, look, they, they won their three home games. Um, there was a lot of positives. I mean, there's still lots of work, like lots to, to work on. And like, again, it's, it's probably worth reminding for people who don't know, like the, the women's team are not professional, so they don't get to spend very much time in camp. So it's very much, you know, getting the players in maybe for one day here and there. And then in, in coming up the games, they might be in camp for two or three days. So it's very difficult to build that cohesion. And then you throw a pandemic on, all on top of it. But I think the biggest encouraging sign for, for women's rugby is that we're starting to see much younger players now breaking through and not just breaking through, but starting and becoming almost already key players for, for this Ireland team. You look at the likes of, I know much has been made of Bavin Parsons, but I've been really impressed with someone like Dorothy Wall as well in the back row. And, you know, they're two young girls and, you know, Bavin Parsons is from Ballina Slow and Dorothy Wall is from Feathered in Tipperary. Like neither of those places are, are known for their rugby. So it's it's really encouraging to see young girls, you know, stepping up and it just it maybe like it points to like what other talent are out there that the IRFU, you know, are, are going to be looking for. Um, you know, so often they've been relying on, you know, players coming through different backgrounds, be it Gaelic football, basketball and things like that. But if they can get players in at a younger age, I think that would be absolutely huge. Particularly because the younger they are, it, it, it allows kind of, I think, younger players again to, to look up to these girls and see what they're doing. So there's a lot of good stuff, you know, I think, with the women's rugby team. Yeah, and I'd, like as you mentioned, those two players, Bevin Parsons and Dorothy Wall, like I think it actually is huge, as you were saying, that they are from outside the traditional rugby uh, rugby areas, that they are young players as well. Like it is, like, might be a bit cynical, put on like a marketing hat or something and say these are two players like that, they can sell the idea of, you know, of rugby to younger girls around the country and build up a pool of talent that can kind of carry you for a large number of years rather than kind of, you know, tr trying to go from team to team and heading into a huge transition at the end, which is what we probably saw maybe three or four years ago with Ireland after the World Cup. But to, well, be, able, to be able to kind of produce players at a, at a younger age and put them out there and kind of inspire the younger generation as well. Yeah, and sorry, like you're you're dead right, and that's not something that's specific to to women's rugby. We should we should make it clear. Yeah. This counts to the men's professional game. Like a, a good example might be okay. It's a bigger example, but if you look at the amount of uh, monster players from West Cork mm. at the moment, like a few years ago, that would have been unheard of. You saw um, on Sunday Thomas O'Hearn made his uh, monster debut, and Jack O'Donoghue had had uh, was in the team as well. It's the first time ever that two Waterford players were in the monster team. So. This like idea of coming through different pathways is not exclusive to women's rugby. It's something that we want to see in Irish rugby as a whole. And yeah, you're right. I mean, the, the more you can get, the, it just it's spreading the net far and wider, isn't it? Mm. And it was funny actually. Just like your colleague Rory O'Connor was on our Sunday paper review a couple of days ago, and he was talking about the Limerick hurlers, and he was remarking maybe like is the the rise of the Limerick hurlers almost something to do with the fact that there are less Limerick players involved in like the Munster Academy these days that. Limerick hurling is just such a massive draw these these days, and you know when you're talking about a, a big pool of a city as well, like it's it is interesting that, as you said as well, like you've got all those players coming from West Cork, and it's I think when players start coming from an area, you start to see more and more of it because because it becomes such a such an attractive proposition. But look, we got to move on to our categories. Uh, we're heading into our final few minutes here on the Six Nations show. 
we'll leave player of the tournament till the last one because I think that has to be the that has to be the closer. But uh, we'll tease it up for you if we have the picture of who the the contenders are. This is the official Six Nations player of the tournament, which anyone can vote for. So you have uh, three from France: Antoine Dupont, Roman Entomac, and uh, Greg Aldris. Then you have Maro Toji and Ben Youngs from England, and CJ Stander is the uh, lone Irish representation on it. Best game. We'll start with best game, Gian. Uh You got first call in pretty much all of these, uh, all of these categories. So in some of them, I did agree with you, but I just picked my own just for the sake of it. So you lead us off. Best game. Yeah, I got in there ahead of Neil. I learned from earlier in the Six Nations. It's always easier to get in. Get in <laughs> these things. Um, best game. I went for Wales and France at the Millennium Stadium. Um, what a cracking game! Like I mean, it came down to the last play. It was just such a a bonkers game. I was actually over in London um, at the time. Ireland were playing England the following day, and maybe it was sentimentality because that's the last uh, last time I've been out of Ireland on a on a rugby <laughs> trip. But it was just cool to, to be over there watching it in you know a packed pub and and seeing it. But um, yeah, just for it to come down to the last play, and you know Nick Tompkins makes that break and just gets scragged. And I think it was Camille Shatter who had mentioned earlier forces the turnover and some cracking tries as well as scored and I thought that was the standout game for me. For my best game I went polar opposite like there were a couple of other contenders like England Wales was a really good game there were plenty of decent matches I went for a game that was pretty poor on the rugby front but was just absolutely enthralling to watch England Scotland Murrayfield 13-6 England in the height of one of those I can't remember which storm it was that landed uh, back in February and washed us all out. It was, it was just kick after kick after kick, but it was the most brutal physical game of rugby. And like, it's funny you look back on Scotland's campaign. They lost their first two games against Ireland and England, seven points each, losing bonus points. There were probably two games that Scotland could have won, and then they go on and they beat Italy, they beat France, and they beat Wales. Like, the margins are so small in it, and in theory, like if you look back at those two games and if Stuart Hogg touches a ball down properly underneath the post, like, that could have been Scotland's Six Nations Championship. Mm, okay, yeah, your proper hipster's choice there. In the <laughs> <world>. <laughs> proper purist. Um, the front row. Best try. I gave you first choice in it. Uh, I'm going to lead off with my selection first, though. I went for... I know you said you left me Justin Tipperich's uh, length of the pitch try against England. That beautiful sweep and move straight from the kickoff. I actually went with something a bit different and complete opposite to my England Scotland choice as well. It's not some like front row prop ball up under the jumper from two yards out, crash over the line. I went for Vakatawa's try against Ireland the other night. Just that beautiful little chip over the top from Entomac. Stockdale coming in, tried to make the tackle at the last second. Entomac just steps outside and pops it outside to Vakatawa and in under the post. It's just the most just the most delicate little chip over the top. The kind of thing like We've seen Finn Russell do over the last few years as well. And as someone texts in, like that combination of DuPont and Entomac, they're just beautiful, beautiful players to watch. Yeah, it was a cracker. And Bakatao is going to make a habit of that at Racing as well, like you said. Mm. With Finn. Um, yeah, I thought Tipperick's try was sensational. I went for Anthony Watson in, in the same game, like a, a set-piece move that actually we're starting to see more and more teams using. Like, like we saw Munster using a variation of it last week. Connacht have used it, the All Blacks, Wallabies. Um, off a line out reverse ball back inside and I think when we were talking about this game back in whenever it was February like I was saying I'm a sucker for a set piece move coming off and working to perfection so I stuck in my guns and went with that Then our next category let's go unsung hero of the tournament um, I went for Claire Malloy um, I think like she's you know arguably the greatest Irish women's rugby player that the country has ever produced um, to take a year off um, and do her like studies in medicine and then come back and not only be able to play the way she has but I mean she's working on the front line in London it's just it's incredible what, what, what she's able to do and I, th I think you know the rugby fraternity in Ireland might be kind of aware of who she is and stuff but on a wider scale I think she deserves um, a lot more plaudits than maybe she gets yeah that's a really good choice actually um, on my own one I just went for a kind of player that I thought maybe was a little bit on, like played a huge role in a team without necessarily getting the credit, certainly in, on these waters anyway. I went for Hamish Watson in Scotland, started every single game for Scotland throughout the tournament. And I think coming off the fact that he lost out in his World Cup 
uh, after picking up an injury right in the early stages against Ireland in that opening game in Yokohama. And I think for him to come back, he was brilliant against Ireland in that opening game of the Six Nations as well. And then throughout the tournament, I think he just played an absolutely huge part. He's one of those guys that, like, I'd say he's an utter nightmare to play against. He's, like, he's antagonistic. He seems to be at every single breakdown and then at the same time seems to make every single tackle, tackle on top of it as well. I think he's just a brilliant player and a complete live wire. Um, biggest disappointment, Keen. I went for... I was going to go for the whole COVID and cancellation or the postponement of the tournament. In particular, though, I just chose the cancellation of the Italy game I, because I think leading up to it, that was the day we all anticipated. We were going to see Ross Byrne was probably going to get his chance at a start, maybe. John Cooney was probably going to start. It was the day we were going to see a good few changes because it was coming the week, or two weeks after the England game. It was going to give them a chance of, you know, I suppose, getting a few players' minutes under their belts leading into that game against France and rest some of the key lads. And I think it ended up just being such a missed opportunity through nobody's fault. And by the time that Italy game comes around in um, by the time that Italy game comes around last week, Johnny Sexton needs to play because he's been out injured. And a lot of those players need to play because they haven't played together in so long. And they just missed out on that opportunity to get valuable minutes into some some younger players. Yeah, no, definitely. Um I went for the biggest disappointment, Super Saturday in general. Um, and <laughs> I think in, in hindsight, any potential super, super Saturday that begins uh, behind closed doors in Clinetley and Parky Scarlets is <laughs> probably setting yourself up for a big fall. It was, um, yeah, like the, the Wales-Scotland game was an awful contest. It was just a tough watch. Um, even see Adam and Jones breaking the record in such kind of, you know, dour circumstances was was difficult the England Italy game wasn't much better and then we obviously had the the disappointment of Ireland's collapse against France so not quite super Saturday and then our last call uh well we'll probably combine these two best Irish player and player of the tournament that doesn't mean we're picking an Irish player for player of the tournament because the player we both chose I know I gave you first choice on us you went for CJ Stander and I was looking through, like, I couldn't really honestly pick someone other than CJ Stander. So I just had to, I had to go with the same with you. He was brilliant across all of those games. And I think he was someone that was under so much pressure. He was one of those guys that a lot of people were criticising after the World Cup and thought that he should be losing out in his place. And going into next year's Six Nations, it probably looks like he's one of the first names on the team sheet all over again. And then player of the tournament, who was your choice? Um, it was between two. I mean, it was between Mario Toje and Anton Dupont, and I went for Dupont purely because aesthetically he's the more uh, pleasing player. I think Mario Toje, there's, there's, you know, just five claims that he's the best player in the world at the moment. But a, I picked a Toje. Yeah, like I'm not surprised, and I don't, wouldn't really have any great, great arguments that like England did win the Six Nations. A Toje was their best player, but. I just love watching Dupont play. I think he's one of those players. If you put on, you know, player camp for a match, just like his uh, support lines that he runs doesn't always get the ball. We saw it like against Ireland again. He's just, he's just brilliant. I think, you know, just on CJ Sander, just quickly. Um, you're right. I was kind of curious to see who you were going to pick because I, I don't think there were any other justifiable mm. like standard players across across the tournament. And you're right. CJ Stander was under a lot of pressure and you look at the pressure the likes of like Connor Murray has been under and Jacob Stockdale now at the moment and you know all those people who are criticizing CJ Stander are gone very quiet now so it just shows you how quickly the 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 mood can shift so um yeah I think Stander's been brilliant he was named monster player of the year as well uh, yesterday I think he's in arguably the the form of his life and uh, he's added a few bits to his game as well so he's I think he's worthy enough to be on the nominees list anyway yeah, it certainly is. Keen, we got to wrap it up there. Thanks a million for joining us today and throughout all the other episodes earlier on in the year. Cheers, Neil. Enjoyed it. So that is uh, it for this week's Six Nations show. And hopefully in 2021, we'll get a clean run through. Uh, big thanks to the producers of this, Shane Hannan earlier in the year and Dahi Boland today. Emma Carl was vision mixing this afternoon. And if you missed anything, you can podcast it all on the OTB Podcast Network. Uh, that's all it uh, that's it for now we'll have more rugby throughout the week here on off the ball so stay stay tuned rugby on off the ball with vodafone official sponsors of the irish rugby team team of us everyone in